Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Our passage begins in Samuel today with Samuel hearing voices in the night. Although he doesn't recognize the voice at first, it is God calling the boy Samuel to serve as the first judge of Israel. This was in the days, of course, when judges were like warrior leaders, consecrated by God to be the human head of Israel. So this is a big deal. Samuel. Here I am. Samuel, here I am. Samuel, here I am. This goes back and forth, this call and response. Samuel continues to answer through the night to this voice calling in the dark. But it is not until the fourth exchange that it becomes clear that it's God who is issuing the call. Things have gotten so bad in Israel that the voice of God isn't even known anymore. No one can distinguish that voice. When God finally gets Samuel's attention, God brings him some terrible news. God tells the boy judge that the house of Eli is corrupt. It is lost beyond any ritual rescue. God will replace Eli and chase his whole dishonest family out of the temple. The leader of the cult of priests is finished. Early the next morning, under extreme pressure from Eli, who's trying to get out of Samuel what it was that the Lord said to him, Samuel tells the old priest to his face that his order of priests and his house are to be terminated and that Eli is to be expelled from the priesthood. Rather than shouting back in the boy's face, fake news or cancel culture, Eli gets quiet. He quietly, submissively, without question, and with total acceptance says this, Yahweh has spoken. The Almighty's vote has been counted. The verdict from the judge of heaven and earth is final. God has spoken, you are out. Eli packs his bags and he leaves without incident. Lost in the drama about Eli's failures and the corruption of his family is the simple truth that Samuel's heart is pure and that his election by God to lead the nation as the first judge is a huge moment. The joyful news of God choosing the next leader for the next generation is buried in God's expulsion of Eli and his family from the temple life. Some things never change. Good news seems to always get buried by bad news. Before the call of Samuel and the expulsion of Eli, our author has written these words. The word of God was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. Religion in Samuel's time had reached such a low point that even its priestly leader, Eli, could not recognize God when God spoke. Eli's eyes were dimming and his spirit was tired and troubled, but when God came to the temple speaking into the care of all of the people, Eli did not even have a clue as to who it was. This has me thinking. Has our religion reached that same low point? Have we become like Eli, our eyesight so weak and our spirit so troubled and tired that we can't even recognize God's voice speaking? God's still, small voice whispering. Some would tell you, oh no, 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 no. They would say, things have never been better for Christianity. They would tell you that Christianity is growing in Asia and Africa. It is spreading in the suburbs. 
And the word of God is alive and well across this nation with more and more people joining mega churches and more and more networks reaching people through TV ministries and all of the purpose-driven churches entering the marketplace of values. They would say, the church has never been better. They would say, God is speaking directly to us. But I'm not so sure about that. Call me a cynic. Or maybe this story awakens something within me. But I think that if God were speaking and calling a prophet in this generation, most of the church would miss the whispering voice of God speaking to the prophet in the night. With no camera lights, with no one turning something into a book deal for a bestseller, God's voice whispering, my daughter, this is God Almighty. My son, I'm speaking to you now would go unheeded. I'm afraid to say it, but I think we've become more like Eli than we want to admit. The church in too many places with too many pastors has become captive to itself. The church in too many places with too many pastors can't hear God's still speaking voice. And in too many places with too many pastors, we've become captive to profit-driven culture and the culture wars that bring in people and money than to the profit-driven word of God. Profit, P-R-O-F-I-T versus profit, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. We need to hear the voice of God. We need to see the prophets when they come. On January 15th, 1929, God birthed a prophet into our nation in Atlanta, Georgia. God sent us a prophet whose voice would become clear and strong. He wasn't perfect, and people like to point that out to me, but neither are you, and neither am I. However, he was undeniably a prophet of our still-speaking God. 58 years ago, in April 1963, from a jail cell in the Birmingham, Alabama city jail, America's prophet wrote a letter on the edges of newspapers, on the scraps of paper that men would pass down through the jail cells to his solitary confinement cell. And finally, he was granted legal paper, legal pad to write the letter. He delivered that letter to seven white clergymen and one rabbi who were all telling him that he was an outside agitator, he needed to slow down, and he needed to get out of town. They said that his presence was unwise and untimely. That deserved a response. In his brilliant little book, Why We Can't Wait, which contains King's letter from Birmingham jail and chronicles the years 1962 and 63, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. answers the criticism of the seven. I stress the need for a social gospel to supplement the gospel of individual salvation. I suggested that only a dry as dust religion prompts a minister to extol the glories of heaven while ignoring the social conditions uh, that cause men on earth a living hell. I asked how blacks would ever gain their freedom without the guidance and support and inspiration of their spiritual leaders. Like Samuel, Dr. King was witnessing a religion in America in 1963 that was so heavenly bound, it was no earthly good. In fact, this became one of his two most heartfelt cries to the American religious community when he wrote his letter from Birmingham jail. He cited two observations of Christians who were critics of the movement. First, he wrote, the Christian community has committed itself to a gospel that has no concern for the social issues of the day. He saw the Christian church as wrapped up body and soul in things that completely distance themselves from the suffering of people and the witness of Jesus Christ for changing that which was wrong in society. Speaking as a man who fully loved the church, 
he wrote, there was a time when the church was very powerful. In the time when the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Whenever the early Christians entered a town, the people in power became disturbed and immediately sought to convict the Christians for being disturbers of the peace or outside agitators. But the Christians pressed on in the conviction that they were a colony of heaven called to obey God rather than man. They were small in number, but they were big in commitment. He continued, things are different now. So often the contemporary church is a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. So often it is the arch defender of the status quo, Far from, being the disturbed, far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structures in an average community are consoled by the church's silent, often even vocal sanctions of things that are. But the judgment of God will be upon the church if it does not change. That's what a prophet says and does. Beyond the status quo compliant body of the prejudicial enablers, Dr. King was disturbed by a second element he saw in his times, an even greater problem that he saw in religious communities around him, churches and synagogues. Those problems came not from the Ku Klux Klan, not from white nationalists, not from separationists, but from moderate whites, Christians and Jews, who were more committed to order than justice, who preferred a negative peace or the absence of tension over and against a positive peace or the presence of justice. In King's words, such people are always waiting for a better time to do something. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. People of goodwill will say, I'm going to be in the next march. You know, after the mayor gets reelected, then I'll talk to him about things that are sort of bugging me. And, you know, uh, maybe next weekend I'll find a little time to put something in my sermon about things that aren't quite right. Dr. King saw a church with no social gospel and with moderate standing on the sidelines taking shots at visionary leaders, real and figurative, seeking freedom, those men and women who are seeking freedom and justice and faith for all people. That's what he saw. He saw cowering, not courageous people. He saw faithless, not faithful people. He saw those who were critical of others trying to set the world on a just trajectory, the moral arc. But from his solitary confinement in a darkened cell in a Birmingham city jail, Dr. King cried out to America just had, as God had cried out to Samuel in the night. America, America, America. 58 years have passed from the time when the black pastor and prophet of Atlanta, Georgia, cried out to us on scraps of paper, on used newspaper, and then a legal pad from his solitary confinement in Birmingham. I would love to tell you that a church with no social gospel at the heart of its actions and moderate Christians who criticize visionary pastoral leadership seeking justice in this city and this nation are all things of the past. But I can't tell you that. That would be a lie. I would like to tell you that the church hears and responds to God's cry on behalf of the poor all the time, but I can't tell you that that's always happening. It's just not true. And I would love to tell you that the garbage workers of Memphis and the working poor of this nation, for whom Dr. King was gunned down trying to organize them for a better way of life, are all fine today. 
But I can't tell you that because that wouldn't be the truth. We don't have to be that way. This church always has had a word in the silent moments and the inaction of others' moments. You and I have no excuse for speaking up and taking part in what changes around us. As a congregation whose origins come from the abolition of slavery and moving slaves in the Underground Railroad from slavery to freedom, our heart and soul is connected to the social gospel. So I have a message for you today. With the whispering cry of God to each of us this morning, America, America, America. We each need to figure out what our response will be. And in responding, I point you to the fourth paragraph in the letter from a Birmingham jail. He writes about those who are telling him to leave town, which, by the way, is really interesting because they're telling him to leave town while he's in jail, and he can't leave town because he's in jail. But that is ironic in a different way. He says these words, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And then these words, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea because anyone who lives inside the United States of America can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. Do you see what he's doing here? He's tying us together. In a time when we feel like we're torn apart, he's bringing us together. We have been told this weekend to not come downtown. We have been advised to go on Zoom or maybe crawl under the table. We've been told to be afraid. We've been told to be quiet. But how can we be afraid and how can we be quiet when we know that it is fear that destroys faith and quiet is wonderful on a monastic retreat, but it's not the place for the musicians and the preachers and the people of First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in downtown Columbus. We will not be afraid and we will not be quiet. We will be courageous and we will stay connected and we will be woven together with those who seek to silence and kill. We will stand and we will march. We will confront evil and we will persevere because we believe that injustice anywhere is real and it is a present danger and threat to justice everywhere. We live our lives as those who are tied together in an inescapable network of mutuality. We live our lives believing that we are tied in a single garment of destiny. We live our lives believing whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So we believe the words of the prophet Martin. That's how we live our lives here. These are difficult days. And we know there will be difficult days ahead with Columbus and other state capitals on lockdown and just under assault, and with our nation's capital looking like Baghdad's green zone during the Iraq war. And by the way, there are now more soldiers, five times more soldiers in the capital of the United States than anywhere in the world. It's crazy. We no longer look like the home of the free and the brave. We look like we're hiding. 
And we've got to come out and start talking because we are all together in one garment of destiny. God created us for difficult days. God created us to face whatever comes. We are strong in our faith. We are courageous people. We are determined people. And we are led by the power of God's Spirit, by the light and the love of God to overcome darkness and despair. A hundred yards from where I am preaching this morning is a new sculpture, the most beautiful sculpture I have seen in this city ever. And there it is on the corner of Cleveland and Broad. It has a name, The Single Garment of Destiny. That's a great title for a sermon. But anyway, tomorrow morning on Martin Luther King's holiday, we will dedicate that sculpture and it will sit there. It's amazing as you move around it, the beautiful image of the family of humanity that is cast in steel becomes invisible. Three tons of steel disappear before your eyes. That doesn't seem possible, but you have to come and see it. Wait till it's unveiled first. Seeing is believing. May we be changed by this sculpture so that we see all of our sisters and brothers who have become invisible to us. And folks, in this last year, there are more and more people that we're not seeing anymore. We have to come together in the fabric of this family we have. I know that we have a long way to go to rebuild relationships and regain trust in our nation and in our world in order to become truly the single garment of destiny rather than a tattered pile of strung out threads of despair. And although it feels like midnight, let's always remember it is darkest before the dawn and the dawn of a new day is coming. As Dr. King said in the closing words of his 1955 sermon, A Knock at Midnight, disappointment, sorrow, and despair are born at midnight. But morning follows, and the psalmist tells us, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. So this faith, our faith, adorns the assemblies of hopelessness and brings new light into the dark chambers of pessimism, end quote. We are and we will always be bound together in a single garment of destiny. So let's be the most beautiful garment ever created in the history of the world. Amen.